I heard about an individual tonight. I never met him, but I heard a story told about him. And I want to dedicate uh, our, uh, what I have to offer to you to him. And I want to dedicate uh, our workshop tomorrow to him. He's Ezra Gilliam. And uh, I didn't, again, I didn't have the chance to meet him, but I, I sense really deeply that as a landowner, a citizen, a conservationist, a man of color, he would really appreciate what we're all trying to do here tonight and tomorrow and through this, this weekend. Um, being at Catawba College also is, uh, it's poignant and it's serious for me because I, I, being in an academic institution, I feel a real responsibility to share with you what my own teachers in my life have shared with me. Uh, an understanding of service, of right relationship, of meaning and justice, and of the role of land and conservation in all of that. Let me just say their names to you. Donella Meadows, Helen and Scott Nearing, Amory Lovins, Roberto Chenet, Wendell Berry, Chuck Mattai, Bell Hooks, Bill Copperthwaite, Linda Hogan. What they've helped me to see is this, that the fundamental challenge of our time isn't climate change or hunger or public health, it's to nurture a culture of belonging and of meaning where we can feel empathy for one another, where we can see one another and meet one another, and in that process feel empathy for the earth itself. This is expressed really well by a writer who's known mostly uh, as a feminist, social critic, but I think is going to be known more in the future on sustainability. This is Bell Hooks, who uh, has returned to her native Kentucky. I'm quoting from her book, uh, Belonging. Can we embrace an ethos of sustainability that is not solely about the appropriate care of the world's resources, but also the creation of meaning, the making of lives that are worth living, end quote. I think that's what our, our work is, to create lives of meaning. And I want to just share some thoughts, some words, really, about the things that have given me meaning. Just take these words in and, and maybe the images and let them wash over you. This really is who I am. Something of who I am is what Andy described, but this is who I am. Bull Run Farm, Devil's Den, Sage's Ravine, Spruce Knob, Dickinson's Reach, Musalak, Arun River Valley, Central Harlem, Cedar Mesa, Chama River, Arch Rock, Drake's Beach, Knoll Farm. That's me. <laughs> That's my story. Those words, those places, they tell my story. And each of you have a story like that. Different words, different places, but the same idea. They're the waters, the food, the wood, the dreams, the memories that literally make up this body in front of you, standing here in front of you. I'm that alchemy of land and people and story. And I didn't uh, always understand this. Frankly, I was brought up thinking that my story was about me. You know, what college I went to, what positions I've held, my social status, how much money I made. But the education that most transformed me was through one word, a word that I learned when I was in college that I want to share with you now. I'd be interested to know how many of you know this word, querencia. Querencia is a mestizo word, which means it originated in northern Africa and made its way to southwestern Mexico, southwestern United States. It was defined by me, for me, by Estevan Ariano. And I'm going to give you all the different ways that this one word is defined in mestizo culture. It's the place where the animal lives. It's the tendency of humans to return to where they were born. It means affection and responsibility. 
It means the place where one feels most secure, the place of one's memories. That word also means the tendency to love and be loved. This word, and actually there are many of them like it in other languages, Kuliani in Hawaiian, Mur in Russian, suggests that our affection and our responsibility to one another as humans has always been intimately connected to nature and to place and to land. And there have been many in my own life who have helped me to, to see this. For example, shortly after college, I worked as a photographer for National Geographic in rural Nepal, where time was counted in the cycles of the moon and in the passing of seasons of rain and snow. Their currency there was rice and one's labor and their wealth, and it was a powerful wealth. Their wealth was the neighbors who would come when something went wrong. Or shortly after that, my friendship with this man, the great homesteader, social critic, architect, Bill Copperthwaite, now 85 years old, a friend of Buckminster Fuller. Both of them grew up in rural Maine. Buckminster Fuller went on to design the geodesic dome, and Bill Copperthwaite brought the yurt to Western culture. Bill's inspiration for his innovative architecture and principles of what he calls democracy and living come from his love of land that has sustained his bold experiment in living. Andrew mentioned Thoreau. Thoreau lived on Walden Pond for two years. Bill's lived on his mill pond for 50 years, without a road, without electricity, and yet the most civilized place I know, the most beautiful libraries, the most wonderful form of human life. There are four miles of down east coastline and tidal estuary that Bill calls home, and this land and he have gently shaped one another in a relationship that's lasted 50 years. And that's described in the book that Andrew mentioned that I collaborated with him on called A Handmade Life. or my alliance uh, and deep friendship with Classy Parker, a third generation resident of 121st Street in Central Harlem in New York City, who wasn't involved in any kind of community activism, but she cared a lot about the woman in this picture who is her mom. Now, growing up in, in New York City, you know, I didn't know really that it was possible to have a third generation relationship with the same street. She has a tremendous sense of place. And Classy decided that the streets were getting too difficult for her mother, and so she got together with five neighbors and turned this vacant lot beside her house. It took them five years to do it, but she turned it into this. And if you know New York City, and you're going down 121st Street to Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Ducati motorcycles are racing up and down. All kinds of things are being sold on the streets. You bang a left into that garden, and you can hear birds. And there are row crops, and there are apple trees, and the guys that were selling whatever they were selling on the corner are in there on their knees alongside you, tending to the tomato plants. I had been a conservationist for 10 years, and I had never experienced before a powerful relationship with land like I did there. It was two hours that I was there, and Classy turned to me and said, Peter, don't you feel like my dad's your dad? And there I looked up and saw her dad at that time, 80 years old, and I wasn't prepared for the the hope that Classy held for us. It was later, after the organization that I worked for then, the Trust for Public Land, bought 60 of these quote-unquote vacant lots 
and, and put them in the hands of local land trusts, urban land trusts, and farmers like urban gardeners like Classy and her dad. And it was only in that time when we were engaging with them that Classy said to me, Peter, if you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up in my liberation, then we've got something to work on together. Classy, perhaps more than any other teacher I've had, helped me to understand that my work in land conservation, your work in land conservation, is fundamentally about healing relationships and making whole people. And so these unusual teachers have brought out in me a fairly eclectic career. Five years as a political consultant, two years as a photojournalist in Southeast Asia, 18 years as a deal maker for Trust for Public Land, and the last eight years as a teacher and facilitator. What connects all of that over 25 years from central Harlem to Nepal to the rocky uh, American West is that I've tried to be a student. I've tried to be a student of the relationship between people and the land, wherever it arises. And this is what I've learned that I want to share. What happens to the land everywhere on the world today, everywhere in America, everywhere in North Carolina, what happens to the land and what happens to the people, to our communities, is the same thing. Said another way, when our human lives and cultures are suffering and at odds for whatever reason, that suffering is going to be made visible on the land itself in the form of dead rivers, damaged atmosphere, destroyed mountains. The pain we feel inside of ourselves as individuals and as a culture will always manifest itself on the land. And I'm not by any means <laughs> anywhere near the first to say that. Wendell Berry has been writing that for 30 years. We are the land, and the land is us. So because of that relationship between soul, our bodies, our culture, and ultimately the land itself, our planet, to heal the earth, one has to be concerned with the human heart and soul. And I have to tell you, as a conservationist, I wasn't trained about anything to do with the human heart and soul. Except when it came time to talk with landowners and to hear about their love of the land and to really understand their story. So today, the only effective long-term method of saving land, saving the planet, is to first do our part to heal our society, to heal our community. So the implications of this are fairly provocative. And that's largely why we haven't approached it in this way before. It suggests that one cannot begin to meaningfully approach the loss of biodiversity, the destruction of our landscapes, climate change, without first addressing the true causes of these problems, which are human poverty, the destructive forces of race and class and privilege, and aspects of the American dream itself. I believe this is true. And I think this is why the new president of Dartmouth College, who arrived just in October, Jim Kim, a Korean American, would controversially suggest that environmentalism, as he sees it practiced by many, is a lifestyle choice. not as an act of social or political uh, change. It also explains my own view that the values of environmentalism are not going to grow as we would hope that they would grow in America until they're shaped and embraced by people who would never, never call themselves environmentalists. So as Andy described, um, almost 10 years ago now, the co-founders and I of Center for Whole Communities began our own experiment and service learning on a 400-acre farm in central Vermont that we actually came to by winning a competition. 
to create a place that would bring together the different elements of environmentalism and social change to see what we could find together. Our vision then remains the same today as when we started, to create a place to reweave isolated and divided sectors and people to enable something more courageous, more innovative to arise. We've observed now with over a thousand alumni how often our movements for change in the United States are deeply disconnected from the land, even while seeking to protect it. But perhaps even more importantly, they're isolated from one another. In short, there was not very much belonging and empathy in practice, even though these values may be written right there on the front page of the mission statement. So we tried to create safe places, safe places where very different leaders from environmental justice, food security, public health, land conservation can dialogue together, understand what is different, not to push through the difference, but to work with the difference, and, and to find out of that what is shared, and to create new alliances. So at the core of this work, and I think at the core of sustainability, really, is relationship. Relationship between people and between people and the land. And we see every week in our residential program how these experiences of land soften and open very, very different humans and help them to see themselves and one another anew. And that work began originally bringing together loggers and wilderness advocates and then conservationists and farmers and then those who care about endangered species and those who care about Hurricane Katrina. And now it's bringing together Republican legislators and Democratic legislators to try to find out a bipartisan solution on climate change. We see, regardless of one's, the color of one's skin, the, the, the name that one gives to your ideology, the size of your wallet, that that experience of the land and place and together creates the opportunity for change. We bring different worlds together. And it can be a game changer. We work really hard to demonstrate the role of land and nature to social justice, but also the role of fairness and equity to conservation. And through this work, I've come to really understand why sense of place, which is revered by the conservationists, has less meaning to others without sense of identity and sense of justice. Center for Whole Communities now, uh, 10 years later, I'm really proud to say, has 1,000 alumni working in 400 organizations and communities in 47 states. And this is what we believe in. We believe in intention that we can help leaders and organization to bring head and heart, head and heart together which is a really difficult thing. My 18 years in conservation, mostly I was trained how to operate out of my head, how to do deals, how to get things done, which is critically important. But Chief Joseph, the renowned Nez Perce leader, said that the longest journey a person will ever make in their life is from their head to their heart. And we've observed countless times how that journey from your heart to your head leads to courage. We also believe in building power, building power from the soil up, helping individuals and communities to take their next best steps toward one another. So we help very different organizations conspire together. Conspire means literally to breathe together. And we believe in, in reciprocal transformation. You know, personal transformation, it just isn't enough today. 
Our goal is for our alumni, everyone with whom we are interacting, to understand how and why their success is bound up entirely in someone else's success. And you know, this brings me right back to Classy when she said to me, Peter, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you can see how your life, your success is bound up in my success, then maybe we have something to do together. So to wrestle with these ideas, I think, provokes really big questions. What kind of world do we want to live in? How are we going to get there? Who's missing from the table that we set? What separates us from one another? How is it that those of us who really care about people, care about people, and those of us who care about land or nature, have so often today ended up separated from one another, working on separate agendas. I want to express in a moment um, what these ideas may mean for an institution like Catawba College or this community, but I want first to ask you to consider a bigger, bigger picture issue. Here are um, two numbers, they're actually two dates that we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Do any of you know or recognize what either one of those dates may be? 2050 has been in the news quite a lot. The International Panel on Climate Change says that 2050 is the date by which all countries, all countries need to be carbon neutral if we're going to get through this period, this time of, of climate change without irreversible change. 2042 applies only to the United States. This is the date, according to our demographers, upon which every metropolitan statistical area in the United States will be dominant non-white. Four states in the United States are already dominant non-white. 40% of the American citizens under the age of 24 today, right now, are people of color. These demographic changes should be celebrated, assuming environmentalists and conservationists can adapt and evolve with them. I embrace these shifts in our population because every time we've had shifts like that, it's brought in new energy and ideas and solutions. But also, I'm excited about these changes for a strategic reason. And that is that all the information that I have says that people of color in the United States are stronger supporters for what you do for land conservation than are white voters. It's true. According to a poll commissioned by the Nature Conservancy by Fairbanks, Maslin, Mullen, and Associates, Voters of color are significantly more concerned than white voters with a whole wide range of conservation issues. Global warming, water and air pollution, loss of working farms, loss of habitat for fish. Not only are they more uh, inclined to support those are concerned, they're also more willing to spend their tax dollars on these issues. 59% all voters of color uh, I'm sorry, all white voters, 59%, 67% all voters of color. What does it mean when the world's largest biodiversity conservation organization, the Nature Conservancy, talks about its role in alleviating human poverty? Is that a moral, strategic, or just marketing dialogue, or is it all three of them? What does it mean for conservationists when a regional land trust in California decides to collaborate with farm workers to create housing? And what can we learn from environmentalists in Oregon guaranteeing health care to independent loggers to help them reduce their impacts on the forest? This is some of the smartest, most innovative conservation that's arising in our country right now. And I think it's evidence for what we're calling Conservation 2.0. In this new era of American demographics, global politics, 
Something new is emerging in the action and leadership of conservation, the way something new is emerging 40 years ago, 30 years ago, when land trusts began to get born. The language and skills of Conservation 1.0 have been technical, transactional, financial, legal, and its goals have often been grounded in science, right, and business and law, counting bucks and acres as its measure of success. I don't know about you, but I feel deeply indebted to that period of conservation for giving us our systems of national parks, wildlife refuges, conserved lands all across this country. This first version of conservation saw the land, but it didn't always see the people. It didn't always see community. In fact, many of our most revered national parks, Yosemite, Great Smoky, Glacier Bay, Yellowstone, and others were created by forcibly removing people, people of color and white people who lived there. That's another story that I was never told in my 18 years working in conservation. And I'm not proud that it took me that long to do the research on my own. That story for a great number of Americans is also a story of conservation. So So Conservation 2.0 builds upon what was achieved over the last hundred years, but is predominantly concerned with how we as a nation and as communities relate to that land and to one another. And the primary skills are not just transactional, but relational. So Conservation 2.0 is about conserving land with a new set of tools on a much larger scale, from landscape scale, to culture scale, to maybe achieve what Aldo Leopold wrote about 60 years ago about creating a land ethic, and this time by engaging people of all kinds of backgrounds. The skills needed in this practice of conservation include story and dialogue across divides and cultural competency, dismantling racism, political agility, and building movements. I wasn't ever trained in those things. None of us as conservationists are trained now in those things, those skills. But the opportunities for success in version 2.0 are hugely expanded memberships, greater public understandings, much deeper collaborations, more funding, more legislative victories, the chance to move beyond saving landscapes to really saving communities, to fulfill Aldo Leopold's most powerful vision for conservation. So why this, this fundamental shift? First, the challenges created by climate change to biodiversity to land are just too complex and far outpace what can be accomplished by laws or, or just by buying land. And second, all the past successes that we've had are going to be challenged more and more until conservationists can effectively make their case that the, their mission of healthy land and biodiversity is relevant to someone like this, Brahma Mahdi. Brahma Mahdi of Oakland, who founded People's Grocery, Oakland, California. He founded People's Grocery to bring healthy food to urban neighborhoods where there were more liquor stores than there are grocery stores. Or this woman, LaDonna Redman of Chicago, who is blending public health, urban gardening, land conservation, uh, job creation, and food security all on the west side. Or Paula Garcia in New Mexico, who's conserving culture and land through the, and their, their, their right to grow their own traditional crops through the protection of their sequias, their waterways. They care deeply about the land, and I know it because they're alumni. I know them as humans. They also care deeply 
about biodiversity. But to be honest, they do not see themselves in the work of conservation. And they would not call themselves environmentalists. Let me share with you how those kind of divides, which are unintentional, but nonetheless there, let me show you how they play out when writ large across our country. We call this map that I'm about to show you the whole community's framework. It's not a map of the way we would like the world to be, trust me. It's a map of the way we think the world is. And it, and it is that it's divided by an ideology of whether your orientation is toward nature or people and whether or not you have privilege in America or you do not. And this is backed up by most of the polling data and memberships and funding groups and even graduate schools. If you care about nature and you have some privilege in America, these are the kinds of things typically that you are most likely going to be interested in land conservation, biodiversity. And if you have privilege in America and your orientation is more toward people, this is the hybrid car set, organic agriculture, renewable energy, consumer choice and the like. And if you have little privilege and your orientation is toward people, it makes sense that your interest would be mostly about air and water quality and, and hunger and, and big meta issues like Hurricane Katrina and democratic participation. And if your orientation is toward nature and you have little privilege in this country, it's, it's pollution of water and air and access to land and urban greening. In a rural context, this is our, the community of people who still live and work on the land in this country. This is our farmers, our ranchers, our loggers, our fishermen. Our point is this, that today, because of the complexity of the problems, because of the demographic shifts, all of these are absolutely needed to create a healthy whole community, but also a healthy whole landscape. And here's the hard part, here's the challenge. For the first time, I think, in the history of our country and in the history of our movements for change, no one of these quadrants is going to succeed without the other. If you care about biodiversity, you are not going to succeed without an alliance with those who care about Hurricane Katrina. And that's exactly what Classy Parker was saying to me years ago. And it took me time to understand it. And this has also been played out so accurately by others. For example, the New York Times op-ed writer Thomas Friedman wrote in July, just this July, and I'm quoting him, we're trying to deal with a whole array of integrated problems, climate change, energy, biodiversity, poverty alleviation, and the need to grow food to feed the nation separately. The poverty fighters resent the climate change folks. The climate change folks hold summits without reference to biodiversity. The food advocates resist the biodiversity protectors. We need to stop working on these issues in isolation." End quote. Conservationists, and this is the world that I have lived in, conservationists risk being left behind by a changing public that doesn't know them. And those who care about public health down here, they're not going to make enduring progress without those who care about sense of place. We now understand that, that our health as a human species depends on what happens up here. And environmental justice advocates risk forgetting the role of land and conserve land in their own healing. Again, the African-American writer Bell Hooks puts it this way in her book, Belonging, I'm quoting again, unmindful of our history of living harmoniously on the land, many contemporary black folks see no value in supporting ecological movements or see ecology and the struggle to end racism as competing concerns. We're not going to make it 
if the struggle to end racism and the struggle to save our planet are seen as competing concerns. And interestingly enough, there was a time in our country when we really understood this. 1964, and, and it has not been repeated since, we passed our first civil rights bill, right? Do you also know it was the same act of Congress that passed our first wilderness bill? And we have never since had those two worlds connected in that way. And when they are connected, that's when change is accelerated. That's when it's possible to fulfill not only Martin Luther King's vision for America, but also Kennedy's vision for America and, and environmentalist visions for America. Our observation right now is that there are three really key issues, doorway issues that we, we call them, that make it possible for conservationists to transcend their quadrant and work with others better. The first is food for sh uh, children, rather, for sure. You know this story that today's children are the first to grow up without a relationship to nature. David Orr's work, the average American child today under 12 can recognize a thousand corporate logos, but not 10 plants or animals native to their own home ground. That's not good for the land, but it's also not good for our democracy. What happens when those kids are our elected officials? Food. How many weeks, we we're talking about the New York Times bestseller list at dinner tonight, how many weeks have Michael Pollan's books been on the New York Times bestseller list? 197 consecutive weeks. Michael Pollan's books on, on food and agriculture. You cannot sell, you could not sell enough books to be on that list for that long and only be selling your books to environmentalists or foodies or Epicureans. Average Americans of all stripes and colors and levels of affluence are interested in where their food comes from. So one of our most effective levers for protecting biodiversity and protecting land has to be today our ability to ally with the rapidly growing food justice and sustainable ag movements in the United States. And finally, faith. I aspire for the day when conservationists can freely acknowledge and say publicly that our work is scientific and it is spiritual. The central work of every land trust that is sponsoring this event and the workshop tomorrow is really about life, and that is deeply spiritual. And you have tremendous faith. I know that you are faithful to your dreams, to the diversity of life. I sense so much faith within you. But most conservation groups are unwilling to speak about spirituality and faith because those things are so often confused for religion, which is traditionally at odds with science, which has traditionally been the religion of conservation. So what is that map I put up there? say to conservationists. I think it begs what Dr. King said long ago. We cannot walk alone. If you want to go fast, then you got to go alone for sure. But if you want to go far, then you got to go together. We got to go together. To do this, we must constantly be asking ourselves, how must I change to meet others, to hear them and to know them? What do we need to do ourselves to join others? And very concretely, this means the very difficult leadership act of sharing power and influence with that emerging majority so that an inclusive vision can emerge that has the far more support from a far larger segment of the community. And it also needs to be real. There's no property boundary today or act of law that will survive a public that no longer 
cares and no longer supports it. Right today, there are 33 active cases of eminent domain taking of conserved lands in different states in the United States. Examples of communities that no longer value conservation. Imagine what would happen in this community if it no longer valued historic preservation. How would this community be different? How would, that have, how would it feel to live here without those assets? That means that those who love nature need to fully engage people, all people, different people, and that's hard. As a conservationist, I was never trained or equipped to move across that map. And honestly, a lot of my friends got into conservation because, frankly, they preferred nature to people. So what does that map say to a college or a university? I think it says this. Is Catawba College or any college, because of its stature, not just positioning leaders, but preparing them to lead, preparing them to lead in this emerging new America? And the most important preparation is understanding how to ally with others and how to authentically move across that map. This woman, her name is Keisha Rahm, 21 years old. She's the youngest member of the Vermont legislature, and it's only woman of color. In fact, it's only person of color. She got elected as a Democrat in a Republican seat. And when I asked Keisha how she got elected to the state legislature, she said to me this, Peter, the most important thing I did was to find the courage to sit down with someone I was a little bit afraid of and listen to their story. Today, every one of us in this room, me most of all, needs to set out from our own safe harbors to meet someone we don't know and to hear their story. That's the work of transformation, not only of our lives, but of the planet itself. This is why we and how we join other movements for change and the way positive change is accelerated. And I believe that that's also the only way that we be able to speak in a more compelling voice, a voice that doesn't demand change, but actually, actually inspires it, a voice expressed not just in facts and, and parts per million and action plans, but also in dreams. And the only, the only evidence I have for you that that's important is to remind you that Dr. King did not say, I have a plan, did he? He didn't say, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream. And I was uh, this kid's age, maybe eight, nine years old, growing up in Fairfield County, Connecticut, outside of New York City. And I remember first taking in that speech. And, and I took it in. I took it in because of that one phrase. And, and forgive me if I don't get it perfectly right, but it's where he says, I have a dream, a day will come in our nation when my four children will be judged not for the color of their skin, but for the content of their character. And I remember hearing that and thinking, and I'm not proud that I was thinking this then, but I was thinking, you mean that's not the way it is in America? That's the power of story, that Dr. King or anyone could reach a young person of a different race and give them an experience of race that not only was positive and stretched me, but put me on a path that I would not ever want to stray from. That's the power of story. And it's the power of an inclusive story. So what is your story? of sustainability that you are trying to draw other North Carolinians to? Can all North Car Carolinians see themselves in that story? And as I reflect on these questions myself, and I do often, 
I'm drawn back to the lived example of one of my own teachers, professors, Donella Meadows, who 15 years ago, she, many years before that, wrote a book called Limits to Growth. But 15 years ago, she wrote an essay called Lines in the Mind. And I want to end just by reading this to you. Dana died 10, 10 years ago. This fresh apple, still cold and crisp from the morning dew, is not me only until I eat it. And when I eat it, I eat the soil that nourished the apple. When I drink, the waters of the earth become me. If the air and the waters and the soil are poisoned, I am poisoned. Now between you and me, there is certainly a line. No other line feels more clear and dangerous than that one. Sometimes it feels not like a canyon. It feels like a canyon, a yawning, empty space across which I cannot reach, and yet you keep appearing in my awareness. Even when you are far away, something of you surfaces constantly in my wandering thoughts. When you are nearby, I feel your presence. I sense your mood, even when I try not to especially when I try not to. If you are on the other side of the planet, if I don't know your name, if you speak a language I don't understand, even then, when I see a picture of your face full of joy, I feel your joy. When your face shows suffering, I feel that too, even when I try not to, especially then. I have to work hard not to pay attention to you. And when I succeed, when I close my mind to you with walls of indifference, then the presence of those walls which constrain my own aliveness are reminders of the you to whom I would rather not pay attention. When I do pay attention, very close attention, when I open myself fully to your humanity, your complexity, your reality, then I find always under every other feeling and judgment and emotion that I love you. Even between you and me, even there, the lines are only of our own making." End quote. Thank you all very much.